Well, we are so excited to continue in part two of our Elephant in the Room series. Um, As I said, this is our series on mental health. We started this last week where we wanted to take two weeks to talk about God's perspective and the church's role in mental health. And last week, um, we were so blessed to have Will Hutcherson here. Let's make some noise for Will one more time. Yeah. Thank you, Will. Um, We were so blessed to have him here. If you didn't get a chance to watch last week's message, please, please, please go on YouTube, our website, go on Facebook and re-watch it or, or watch it for the first time. It is incredible. Um, and we're actually very blessed. Will is actually here again today in the lobby. Um, we, you, you all were the service where some of you didn't get books because right. y'all bought so many he ran out. Um, but he, Will has more books, more resources in the lobby. He'd also love to get a chance to say hey to you if you didn't get a chance to talk to him last week as well. So we're blessed to have Will joining us again today. Um, and, and he shared some stuff with us last week. Um, I, I wrote some of these down because it's just so, I wanted to make sure I got it right. He shared with us that in March 2020, the disaster distress helpline saw an increase of 891% in call volume. Wow. Um, the, he, he shared other stats like there's a rise in suicide among teens and young people. Um, there's a rise of anxiety and depression rates that have accelerated in all ages during the pandemic. Um, and, and so today we want to continue this conversation. Mm-hmm. Uh, we want to talk about the elephant in the room. And, and, and we're going to have another interview with pastor, author, speaker. <laughs> yes, Wes Holtz. Oh, my um, goodness. Um, now, yeah. I, could, I, I could, yeah, let's yeah. make some noise for Wes, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Wow. <laughs> wow, you need me to buy you lunch or something? Yeah. Yeah. That'd be great, actually. Yeah, okay. Now, there's a lot of ways I could introduce you, That's Wes. That's true, yeah. Um, I want to keep my job, so not, I won't share every way, but. but <laughs> it's getting real now. <laughs> There's a, there's a lot of ways I can introduce you this morning. I can introduce you as pastor, um, you know, co-pastor, co-lead pastor, yep. um, you know, Caleb's dad, which there is a role I often, you know, I often get to live in. That's right. Um, um, Becky's husband. There's a lot oh. of different, but you, you said to kick things off, you wanted to introduce yourself in a specific way. So I want to go ahead, go ahead and do that. Thank you. So in some settings, uh, the way I'll introduce myself is this, uh, that I'm a grateful follower of Jesus in recovery from depression and anxiety, and my name is Wes. Oh, they caught on. So they knew. You all all got the memo. See, last service, we had to to teach them a little bit. You know, whenever someone introduced themselves like that, it's always customary to go, hi, Wes, afterward. They did a great job. feel welcome. Yeah, Yeah, they did a great job. Um, Now, why that specific introduction? Because you want want to make sure that you're like, I want to introduce myself to this service. Here's what I want to say. Well, I love the series that we're in. Thank you for your part in bringing it to the teaching team, Taylor, mm-hmm. and uh, help us have this conversation. So the, it, this has two important things about me uh, and, then, and my name. Mm-hmm. So the, the first thing is, is that I'm a follower of Jesus, and I want to share that first and foremost uh, because it's my fundamental identity. Mm-hmm. It's the bedrock of my life to be a follower of Jesus, to be a child of God and a person of worth, to be Abba's child, to belong to the Heavenly Father, to know that I am loved no matter what, that I have a God who will never leave me or forsake me. I have a Savior who gave his life for me, and the Holy Spirit wants to live and move in my life and have his being inside of me. And I share this with you, not because it's just for me, but because it's for you too, Taylor, and it's for every single person here. See, this is not something I achieved. This was a gift that I received that you also can receive as your fundamental identity, the bedrock of who you are. No matter what other people say about you, no matter what you might say about yourself, bottom line is this. One of Jesus' best friends, a guy named John, said that anybody that would receive Jesus and call upon his name, he gives the right to be called children of God. And then he says that that's who you are. You may not know it yet, but no matter your circumstances and no matter your brain chemistry, you are a child of God and a person of worth. And that is fundamental for me, Taylor. There's a couple of truths that I stole from Pastor Rick Warren about my own journey, and I want to share those as well um, to just help encourage you today. Um, and that is these three things. Your chemistry is not your character. That's good news, isn't it? <laughs> your chemistry is not your character. Another thing Pastor Rick Warren says is this, that your illness is not your identity. Your illness is not your identity. And this third one I added is this, that your diagnosis is not your destiny. Your diagnosis is not your destiny. In our culture, we can get caught up in a label, especially if it's spoken by a doctor. 
And I don't know about you, but I just think, well, there it is. It's hopeless. I give up. Uh, this applies to lots of different you know, health struggles. Yeah. I'll never forget when my father was diagnosed with cancer. That, and we call it the C word, mm -hmm. just hung over us mm -hmm. like a dark cloud. And so I think it's important that we remember that our fundamental identity is not cancer patient or heart patient or a person with anxiety or whatever label that somebody might give us or we might even give ourselves. Yeah. Because of the grace of God, we can know that no matter what, we belong to God yeah. and his love is for us. So that's why I wanted to start with that. That's good. <laughs> no, so that, that's good. So if I, if I did it, you know, it would be, I'm a grateful Christian in recovery from codependency and perfectionism. My name is Taylor. And, and that, oh, well, thanks. Hey, hey, thanks. Hey, hey. They're paying attention. Yeah. Um, if I ever need reassuring, I'm just going to say that in a room and hopefully someone will, someone will respond. I know. We should do this more. Um, um, so, but, but what it does is it, it right sizes where our real identity lies in. Yeah. That's what this does. Right. Um, and, and I, but I, I do want to take a moment in, you know, in, in your introduction you said you're in recovery from depression and anxiety. Yeah. And, and, and I know you and I, you know, we, we've talked a lot about sort of, you know, the different, we, we live in the same neighborhood, but we live on different streets is how we put it. That's good. Right, where, yeah. where, where you know, yours would be depression and anxiety, mine's codependency, perfectionism. There, you're, there's bleed over in both of those. Sometimes we cross paths. Yeah, yeah. we cross paths. Sometimes I'll see you down the block and wave. But, right, right, but, right. But, but um, I, I'm just wondering, how has your, what, what has your journey with depression and anxiety been like? And would you be able to, maybe just describe it for someone like me or someone listening who, who maybe is unfamiliar with what, what that sort of looks like in yeah. your everyday life. First, thank you for asking what my experience is. I think that's an important thing for us all to do. We'll talk about that in a moment. But um, when my chemicals are not working in my brain, what it looks like on my street is this. Um, I'm susceptible to either uh, undescribable dread or unstoppable worry. And the dread can be so deep that I don't think there's any hope for me. Um, and I can't connect to God. Um, I might believe in that God is there, and I do, but I, I struggle to, to feel or experience God's presence. And the worry is, is like this, uh, that I can enter into this, this spin cycle around a thought. And it could be a memory 20 years ago or a decision I could have made differently 10 years ago. And just some weird thing will come into my mind and I'll fixate on it. And I'll just begin to, to work it around in my brain and it's, it's, it's just like it's stuck on spin cycle. Uh, if, you, if you've never experienced this, one thing you could do today, you could go drive around a cul-de-sac 500 times in your car. <laughs> and you'll start to get the sensation of what I'm talking about. And those of us with anxiety... Uh, experience sometimes because you'll be out of gas you'll be tired and you would have gotten nowhere and that's kind of the my experience with with anxiety and I'm powerless to stop it um, it seems like one, one way to think about it is that uh, settings on a phone uh, let's say that uh, on my phone the brightness represents depression okay so my settings are like this it's set at like a three brightness mm -hmm. when I start the day yours might be at like an eight mm -hmm. um, when it comes to anxiety, let's, let's take ringtones. Uh, maybe you have a ringtone at like five, and it's of a real happy song, you know. Uh, my ringtone is blaring at ten, if this is anxiety, and it's Darth Vader's Imperial March. The dun, you know, dun, that's dun, it. dun, dun, dun. Yeah. yeah, yeah, That's what's coming, <laughs> right? You know, yeah. people sing, tomorrow, tomorrow, it's always tomorrow, and I'm always thinking, it's only a day away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, so <laughs> that's my experience for example <laughs> so and this is this is helpful thank you for thank you for sort of bringing us into this um and and you know will, will said this last week right. um he talked about how how there's his will's word was despair which is a great word to capture totally this um he talked about how there's you know there's situational despair yep which is for you know a time or a place or a season or something like that yeah and then there's more long-term or clinical even even and so I, I want to ask, when did this struggle start for you? What is the, what does this look like in your life? Yeah, I love the way that Will described it because some of our settings can be restored back to the you know factory yes. defaults, if you will. Yeah. And so we experience temporary struggles. Mm -hmm. Mine's been going on for a long time. <laughs> in fact, some of my earliest memories are anxious ones, or uh, 
depressive thoughts. Even when I was a child, I remember being obsessed and worried about like whether my dad or mom were going to run out of gas in the car. Mm. Every time it would get below half, half, I would start to freak out and sweat and like have a panic attack. And the same uh, is true with like when bad things would happen, I would just like just brood on it. And I've always been, uh, you know, struggling with those, those kind of things, but it really took off on a whole new level in my mid twenties when I was diagnosed with aortic valve disease and had a series of surgeries, one of which on my 25th birthday. And after that open heart surgery, they replaced my valve uh, with a mechanical one. And the surgeon came to visit me the last day and said, you might experience some depression or anxiety. And I said, not me, doc. I'm tough. I'll be fine. Thanks for the warning. And within six weeks, I was a disaster, a wreck. Because uh, the depression came, as I, as I thought, well, what if I could die? And that only, that experience reinforced my mortality. Uh, but then the heart valve they put into me, into me clicks. And so it provided a soundtrack for my anxiety and panic attacks. So every click in between each one, I would think, is it going to click again? Because if it doesn't, I'm dead. But if it does click again, you know, it's going to keep me awake. It's going to bother me. So I went weeks without sleep and just constant anxiety was there. And this, this ticking just made it worse. And, and the, so I was a wreck. The very thing that, the very thing that was keeping you alive was also causing you this bingo. Yeah. So oh I'm like, gosh. you know what? I'm going to get this heart valve and get rid of it. Yeah. Well, then I'll be dead. Yeah. So, you know, cue depression, right? Wow. Told wow. you so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. So you, at this time, your, when we're thinking of your soul, okay? Yeah. This, this holistic, your inner being all in one. So your soul, you have this colli these collision of things happening. You've got yeah. physical struggle. You've got emotional struggle. You've got mental struggle. You've got, you've got spiritual struggle yep. as a result of all that. Yep. Right? Some is genetic, too. Some, some genetic, yeah. I came yeah, into yeah, this. Yeah. 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 yeah, sort of. Yeah, you're, like you said, you said, your settings were sort of already adjusted Just already on, off, on the phone. Yeah. So one thing that, that I think in, in church world we hear sometimes is a response to some of these things. And we're going to get real. Remember this elephant in the room, okay? Yeah. Um, is, is, is to just, we'll just pray harder. Yeah. We need to have more faith. We need to, you know, well, have you read your Bible? Have you, you know, have you, you know, sort of all these questions, all these things, insinuating that there's something spiritually that's lacking that you could do. And you've shared with me that that response actually crushed your spirit versus yeah. encouraged it. What, what did you so, do? So when, about with my bit? body weak, my mind weak, um, my spirit, I was hoping could rally, yeah. you know, and nobody ever came out and told me this. In fact, I was involved in very loving Christian environments growing up and even as a pastor, you know, <laughs> I'm here for crying out loud. And yet the message that I told myself was I'm a second class Christian because people would say, I prayed and my worries went away or I'd read the Bible uh, and I read these verses of do not fear uh, there's 365 of them, and I, I, I interpreted them as God screaming at me, yeah. you know, stop it. And I learned later that the context of those is a gentle parent coming to you and embracing you saying, don't fear, I'm here. Mm -hmm. And there's a big difference yeah. in those two. But I just heard, you know, uh, rejoice in all things, you know, pray without ceasing. Uh, you know, and, and somehow told myself, well, it's good for everybody else, but something must be wrong with me. And everybody else is feeling happy, and they can sing along, but I, I'm struggling, and I thought it was just me. So I kind of got to the end of my rope, um, and I went to see, uh, based, you, know, you know, Pastor George was with me at the time. Of course, my wife was like, you need help. Uh, everybody was like, you need help. So I went to see a, a counselor who then referred me to a, psychi a psychologist who then referred to a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh, boy, I've hit the rock bottom now. And... Uh, so they encouraged me to get on uh, medication and then start intensive therapy. Mm -hmm. And uh, the medication part was the hardest part. Was it? Yeah, so let's, let's, let's camp there for a second. Because um, I know that for probably a, some of us here and a lot of us watching, um, I know that that topic or that idea of, of medication, of medicine, is, is, is a hard one for some of us. Yeah. And so what was that decision like for you to, to say, okay, I'm going to... I know I need this, so I'm going to get on this. Yeah, the hard, it was just like surrender. It was like giving up. Mm -hmm. It was, and it was like, uh, man, you really are messed up. This is my inner scripts, you know sure, what I'm saying? Sure, yeah. And uh, you, you've got your own mm -hmm. tooth. Thank God we've been able to share these mm -hmm. together, so I know I'm not alone. 
And, and yet that's what it was telling me. You know, you're, yeah. you're just not able to do it. You're weak. Uh, again, you're second-class Christian. Most Christians don't need this. Um, and that was, it was not quite out in the open, so people didn't talk about it. This is like 25 years ago. Sure. You know, so people didn't really share much about this uh, in environments like this. I can't believe I'm sitting up here talking about it right now, to be honest with you. Uh, there's that voice in my head saying, you better be quiet. But um, yeah. I'm not going to do it. So uh, with, the, with the medicine, it was reinforced. I had two nurses actually say to me when they were checking me in, uh, you're a pastor. Why don't you just pray more or read your Bible? Nurses said that to you. Yeah. Wow. And that is just two. Yeah. You know, I've seen a lot of nurses. I got heart problems, you know, so I see somebody every month. Yeah. Uh, so I don't want to oversell it, but those two joined a chorus that was already having sure. a parade in my brain sure. uh, that it was uh, weakness. And yet at the same time, I felt like this was God's grace for me. Mm-hmm. There's an old preacher story, and since I'm getting to be an old preacher, I guess that's what I got to go with. And so I remember this story when it came to the topic of medication. That there's a guy that has, a, his, his city has a flood. So he crawls up to the roof of his house, starts crying out to God, please God save me. Uh, all of a sudden a rowboat comes by, so dude says, jump in my boat, it'll save you. He says, no, I'm praying God's going to come and save me. So the guy leaves, and then next comes a motorboat. The guy on the motorboat says, hey, jump from your roof and get in my boat, you'll be saved. He said, no, I'm counting on the Lord to save me. And so the guy left, next comes a helicopter, they throw a rope out to the guy, and they say, come on up, climb on up, we'll save you. He says, no, 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 I'm waiting for God. He's going to save me. And so the man ends up dying in the flood. He gets to heaven and he has a conversation with the Lord. He says, Lord, I trusted you to save me. And you didn't save me. He goes, what do you mean? I said, you're a rowboat, a motorboat, and a helicopter. And you didn't take any of the three. And that's what medication kind of became for me. It was a lifeline. Uh, yes, it can be abused. That's why the counseling needs to go with it. And I've been in 14 years of counseling. Uh, but then I came across people that were willing to tell the truth, even spiritual leaders. There's a giant in uh, Christian literature named Dr. Lewis Smeeds. And uh, he, about 20 years ago, talked about the ground zero of his hopelessness uh, when he was suffering with depression. And he said that God's grace came to him in a lot of ways. But then he wrote this, and it jumped off the page. He said, God also comes to me each morning and offers me a 20 milligram capsule of Prozac. With this medication, God clears the garbage that accumulates in the canals of my brain overnight and gives me a chance to get a fresh start in the morning. I swallow every capsule with gratitude to God. And I found this combination of several things, you know, medication, uh, counseling, small groups, uh, quiet time with the Lord, all these things together um, help me find healness, uh, healing and wholeness. Yeah, yeah. And thank you for sharing that, first of all, and, and bringing us into that. And one thing that, that I admire, admire you for is you're not, just an, you don't just, you're not just an advocate for those ways to get help, which are so necessary and can be so healing. But one thing that you've done offline, offstage, if you will, is, is you've pointed back to the ultimate source of healing, too. Oh, yeah. And, and, and that's been so, so encouraging. And I know you found a lot of that through the church, which is, which is ironic, which, you know, because you, you're, you, your whole struggle with mental health. Right. Um, you know, you've not only attended church, but you've been a pastor, too. Right. Um, and you've had, you know, you, you, to have this perfect storm, you have that, you have this, this chorus of you're not worthy, you're not worthy, of, right. of you know, you're not a you're second-class Christian, all those things. Um, and so for you in the church, I, I want to move us to that part of the conversation. Mm-hmm. And this is a collective conversation, if you will. Yep. What's the, what is it? I am the church. You are the, we are the church. You are the church. Yeah. I'm the church. You're the church. We are the church together. There it is. Yeah. Yeah. Some, something like that. And I, and I think it's important, though, that we remember, because sometimes we, we categorize the church as like the government or uh, you know, some institution. Yes. And uh, the, the church is not a building. And the church is not a 501c3 nonprofit. Who's the church? You're the church. I'm the church. We are the church together. Remember the church, the very word means the gathered people of God. Yes. And so when people come to me and they say, I'm mad at the church, I say, okay, who are you mad at? <laughs> A lot of times they say, you. <laughs> you know, it's just easier to blame the church. But there's thousands of us that make up yeah. Grace Church. So we have to think about 
our individual roles yes. in this because we all, you represent not only Jesus, but you represent Grace Church, whether you know it or not, exactly. if you're a part of it. Exactly. Our, our individual role and responsibility right. plays a role in the overall collective totally. of the church. And so I want to pose a question, and I want to ask it to you. Yeah. What is my role as a Christ follower when it comes to mental health? Thinking, once again, this is about our individual responsibility, but also if we're thinking collective, we're thinking for the church as a whole. What is it? Yeah, first move, I think, would be this, is to be humble. Hmm. To be humble. Now, just because I struggle with anxiety and depression doesn't mean uh, that when people come to me, I don't want to fix them sure. or tell them what's wrong or draw straight lines where there are none. You know, I'm, I'm quick on the draw on that. Just ask my wife, you know. I'm struggling with this. I'll tell you, well, it's because of this, you know. And I, I, I can be prideful that way. And humility just means down to earth. Yeah. And we have to admit that there are some things that we don't know. Mm-hmm. And that's, struggle, that's a struggle for me. And this is not a simple enough topic. We heard this from last week from Will. I thought it was so important. This is not a pull yourself up by your own bootstraps topic, Okay. This is not a suck it up, pray harder. Look, uh, I would have thought of that already uh, in my own struggle. Sure. And the person that I tell that to, and I've done it too, you know, uh, they've already thought of that. They've tried everything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and they can't find the answer when they come to us. And so the first thing we need to do is to be, to be humble. And to, to recognize that when it comes to the topic of suffering, we don't know. Why suffering comes. Sure, there's some suffering that we can explain. I mean, when I do something that I know is going to harm myself, I can explain why I'm hurt. When you do something that bumps into me, I can explain uh, it's because you did this. But that's not all suffering, right? Most suffering is mysterious. We don't understand why. Sometimes the system fails to work. When Hurricane Irma came through our neighborhood a few years ago, took off Arla and I, you know, we were scared, uh, as were you, and... I don't think it's because I didn't do my quiet time one day last February that the Lord is smiting me, yeah, you know? Yeah. <laughs> now, we do that for other cities. Well, I don't know why it hit New Orleans, right? They're sinners yeah, over there, you know? Sure. Mm-hmm. But we try to explain this stuff. Yeah. And yeah. we are out of our league. Mm-hmm. This is stuff for the Lord to know. Jesus didn't ever answer the question. Mm-hmm. He just moved on. Yeah. So we got to be humble. And, and with that, let me... Okay, elephant has been named. Let me just name this, Taylor. For your generation, my generation has not always done a very good job of that. And thanks to your leading up, I have learned that your generation especially has been harmed by my generation and other Christian know-it-alls like I am sometimes. And they've been shut off and hurt and not heard in the midst of their suffering. And they have just said, so long, church. Mm -hmm. If that's church, I'm out. Mm -hmm. They love Jesus. Um, But you representing your generation and me as a pastor, let me just say, for anybody that's been hurt by the church, because you've been told in the midst of clinical depression, you don't have enough faith or you fill in your own story. I'm sorry. That is not right. Mm -hmm. And on behalf of the church, we want to do better. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry that that's happened to you and your friends. You grew up here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, You know, I, up here, I wish I could, I said this last service, I wish I could have rows of stools behind me with, friends from youth group yeah. here, um, friends from high school, friends from college who, um, who have walked away from the church because of harm that's been done, especially around this, about, about a, not having an available and safe space to have those kind of conversations of, of I'm struggling mentally without it ending in, well, then you must not be praying enough. You yep. must not be reading what God says. You must not be doing those things. Um, and, and, and let me say this, thank you that I'm grateful that Grace Church is a church where we can sit up here for two weeks and have this conversation. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I mean, the, the response that I've gotten just this week 
from, from you know, people my age who, who have just sort of, you know, or, you know, whether they've watched the whole message or whether they sort of, you know, are watching from afar, um, um, the response I've gotten has been so encouraging. Mm-hmm. And, he, and here's what I'll also say. Um, I'm grateful for God's grace that goes before <laughs> and is with us and, and goes behind us too. Um, and so I, I, I don't, I have hope today. Let me put it that yeah. way. I have hope. That, that even though it was a certain way, maybe not at Grace Church, but in another experience somewhere, yep. um, I have hope today that it's not always going to be that way. Yeah. Um, yeah, mainly because the, the church is, belongs to Jesus. And yes. We were talking about this verse, about the gentleness of Jesus. Yes, yeah, uh, and, and how you know, Jesus, who himself has the power to, to crush sin and death, but yet he displays this humility and gentleness with those that, that, that might be struggling, those that might be on their, on their last leg. It comes from Matthew 19. It says this. It'll be on the screen. It says, uh, He will not crush the weakest reed or put out a flickering candle. Finally, he will cause justice to be victorious, and his name will be the hope of all the world. Um, this same Jesus that could crush sin and death is gentle enough to not crush the weakest reed. Yeah. And, and I think that's the humility and that's the gentleness that, that we need. Yeah, and as far as parents go, uh, we parents, we, you know, I, th- I think what Will was saying last week is important in that we had a totally different experience than our kids yeah. growing up. You know, Taylor doesn't know any life before 9-11. Mm. You know anything? You grew up during the Great Recession. You know you, you've had a pandemic in the formative years it's of been your fun new, so far. new family life. How's things going, Taylor? <laughs> you know, and and couple that with the online pressures and all the yeah. stuff that you know, Facebook's you know had paper uh, papers released about yeah. the way that they've manipulated the the clicks and and uh, and it's it's affected you guys, yeah. and and we haven't always been sympathetic. That I haven't. Let's just say, and so. Um, with that, we've got to recognize these these uh, generational mm-hmm. uh, differences, but there's also geographical differences. Yeah. Uh, there's some places in the world like this is just not spoken of. Some places in the country, um, Pastor George and I were talking about his uh, uh, experience with his extended family in Puerto Rico, and in the Latino culture, this is not mentioned. Uh, this is a, a, a undiscussable elephant in the room. And so there's all of these things. And um, so what do we do if we don't? If we're like not going to uh, be prideful and give answers. What are we supposed to do? Well, we can be with one another. We can listen to one another's stories. We can do what you just did. Say, tell, tell me your story and then listen. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a practice in Judaism called Shiva. Um, when somebody mourns, what will the relatives do? They come and they sit with their relatives who've lost somebody. Wow. And they sit with them for seven days straight, morning, noon, and night. Wow. And they don't say anything. Uh, this may be what Paul had in mind when he wrote in Romans uh, some instruction for us. Look at this quote from Pastor John Orberg. He said, Shiva may be the greatest example in the Bible of what Paul commands us in the book of Romans when he says, mourn with those who mourn. It's so striking to me. He doesn't say fix people who mourn. He doesn't say give advice to people who mourn. This is really important for us to be a community where it's okay to not be okay. So, with that freedom to, to, to just offer people space to name what's going on, I think it's important. Yeah. Pastor Casey told us in the teaching team, uh, she said, at times I feel like there's something wrong with me because she struggles with depression. She said, I think it must be a character flaw. I'm weak. I'm messed up. God must be mad at me. Where is God? I can't seem to think my way out of it. The cloud is there. Even if I rejoice in the morning, it's still present in the rest of the day. Yeah. See, what I love about that is she, she's got space to say that stuff yeah. and we need to offer that to one another uh, as the church and what I love about this idea you shared about just being with people and sitting with them um, it, it's, some, it's something that we can start today that's right do it right now it doesn't have to be something that we, we need to wait on or something that we need more training for or something that like it can be something that we can just start doing this practice today yeah so I'm going to go back to our question what is my role as a Christ, Christ follower when it comes to mental health it's to be humble, but, but you've shared with me, you think there's one other piece to this as well. In addition to humility, what else is yeah. there? In addition to humility is to, uh, to offer hope. Hmm. See, we're the one group of people on planet Earth that are specifically assigned this responsibility by God. 
to offer hope to people who are in distress. And that would include people like myself and others who struggle with mental health. Uh, hope is like oxygen to the soul. If your body doesn't have enough oxygen, uh, you're, we're in trouble, right? But if our soul doesn't have enough hope, then we can wither away. And the Bible is riddled with this, filled with this. Of all the topics that you could uh, name in, in Scripture, certainly love would be one of the top ones, but hope would be right up there with it. Faith, hope, and love. These three remain. And we need hope in our life. One example of this, uh, for anybody that's struggling, really not only with mental illness, but with anything, uh, one of the best passages is Romans 8, 26 through 38. Would you read that yeah, for yeah. us and share that, that hope with us? Yeah. Hear this, these good words of hope. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for. But the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father, who knows all hearts, knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ right. who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. That is That hope. is good news because that means when my chemicals aren't working... God is still at work in ways that I cannot see. In fact, the Holy Spirit will even pray for me, groaning with words that I can't understand on my behalf for the Lord to come and rescue me. And here's the cool thing. God will take suffering that he did not cause, and he will use it and transform it to be a blessing for other people. How good is our God? Since depression and anxiety is not my primary Identity, these are words that can give me and you hope and assurance today that nothing can separate us from God's love. John Wesley said on his deathbed, best of all, God is with us. And that's what I want to say when it comes to this topic. Best of all, God is with us because that means there is no depression or anxiety, mood disorder, eating disorder, major depressive disorder, personality disorder, schizophrenia, not ADD, not ADHD, not OCD, not ODD, not PTSD that can separate us from the love of God. Not any addiction, not any affliction, not any hurt, habit, or hang up. There is no sin. There is no separation. There's no trouble that you and I can go through that can separate us from the love of Jesus Christ, our Lord. But the people of God say amen. And this is the hope that the world is longing for. This is the hope that people who are hurting need. And you also are among those who are called to be Christ's ambassadors and to share this good news. Because if you haven't read it yet, the end of the book points to victory. Where these troubles will be no more. Where the Lord will return and he will wipe every tear from your eye. So I'm grateful today to be able to name the elephant in the room, to be able to say as a pastor of this great church that I'm a grateful Christian, follower of Jesus, in recovery from depression and anxiety. And you too, friend, are welcome in this place with this Savior. His name is Jesus. Let's stand for prayer. So Lord, we love you. We thank you that there is no darkness that's too great for you. That Lord, in you we can find the hope that we need. So humble us now before your great throne of mercy and grace. 
Forgive us the ways that we have not loved you or not loved our neighbor or ourselves the way that you've called us to. Lord, draw us anew to yourself right now. Use even this song to bring us home that we might make our home in the hope of your grace. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody agreeing said, amen. amen. Well, let's worship the Lord with this closing song. Altars open, opportunities to pray online, and, of course, at your seat. Let's worship as our team leads us.